please pay attention to the host. Justice Anthony Kofi's um, vetting is actually uh, going on in Parliament. We'll be crossing over there. But gentlemen, I'd like to say a very big thank you to you. Our guest, Dr. Dixon Aoudoumakou Kisi, Member of Parliament, Anya Soutoum, and Mohamed Suparu, uh, Member of Parliament, Sisala uh, West. Well, let's cross over now to that vetting of those nominees, uh, of course, for the Supreme uh, Court. A state what have you every aspect of the law but as you see what creates the controversy for the judiciary are the very few political or politically connected cases that are had which are uh, some statistics i think was done recently and it's less than five percent of the cases overall cases that the judiciary handles and it is the five percent which are because of the of course we understand our politics the emotions of people people perceive that no this is a judgment that should be going here that should be going here it's you judgment is given based on the evidence and the law somebody may be dissatisfied naturally but it does not mean that the judgment given is tainted by politics or influenced by politics. That's not the way I see the judgments. I hear there's a lot of cry that it is political, it is this, but I will not look at it that way. In there are very few cases which are in natural fact political, if I may put it that way. Less than 5%. And those 5% seems to cover and override the good work that the judges do in respect of the 95 or so percent that it's not political. The estate matters, the criminal matters, the land matters, and what have you. That is, that is my view. Oh, Honorable Chair, I wanted to know from the nominee what, what in his opinion is the root cause and uh, what, if he gets the nod, will he do to reaffirm that position uh, that the Supreme Court and its judges are not political and they are not partisan that's that's what i wanted to get from you oh. um and again your the five percent statistics you are talking about my lord um with respect do you do you have a source where where did you get that from i know that i know that the judiciary sometimes does in tenor there's a there's a we do in tenor and i know of this five percent but i can't immediately tell you the source but i know that the judiciary has tried to find out how many of the cases are political or political con how come there's so much argument and talk about judgments being political that's that is the point but i think what i would do would be to stick to the judicial oath that i, will, I have taken as a court of appeal which if this committee gives me the nod and the plenary approves if i'm sworn in i swear to the judicial oath to be fair to all manner of persons without fear or favor. That is the oath that every judge swears and goes, goes by. Thank well, you. Lord, what, I'm sure you're familiar with the American theory of law. They call it the realist theory, that in spite of all the talk about principles and rules, Every person, including all judges, have their inarticulate major premise. The main thing that influences their thinking, which has nothing to do with the rules, the practice, in relation to uh, the question of the honorable member, do you think that the inarticulate major premise of judges are the issues that are in question here? I, I, do, I do not think that the judgment of judges are influenced inarticulately, to use, to use your expression, by the major premise which is not articulated, no. The evidence, the, the law, the procedure, sometimes how good a lawyer is, even because in terms of exercise of discretion, this all comes into play. So it's not about something
premise being articulate or inarticulate. Yes, thank you. Honorable Speaker, I, I've observed that the, yeah, Honorable Chair, thank you. I, I've observed also that the, the nominee is an appeals court judge who has, and, uh, has sat on a number of cases as an, uh, of the high court as an additional uh, judge. Um, I'm just wondering, we appear, as far as I know, we have a, a number of, a good number of high court judges. Some of them are very senior. Uh, how come you appear to be always the man to, to come into, to, to serve as an additional high court judge in being an appeal court judge? You, you, you're still, you are still found useful to be used as, uh, well, not to be used, but to be put um, as an additional uh, judge in being an appeals court judge. There are a lot of high court judges. Why do you think you are always selected to do that kind of, uh, play that kind of role? I remember I can, sitting here, I can remember only one criminal matter which was assigned to me to handle as an addition. That's about four or five years ago. I can't remember being handled any other and there was a reason the one or two or three high court judges were assigned because they, they recused themselves for whatever reason. The then chief justice then assigned it to another court of appeal judge who also recused himself, and then it was assigned to me. That is the only case that I, I don't want to mention the case, but there's only one which is still pending. I don't remember any other case which was assigned to me as an additional high court judge. Presently, no, I don't remember. I wish he mentioned the case, um, but be it as it may, let me just ask my final question. My Lord, there's a lot of havoc that operations of Galamsey, for example, are wrecking on our environment and our society. Um, going where you are going, what do you think should be the judiciary attitude to cases involving Galamsey? So far, it doesn't appear to be deterrent or exemplary enough to take people off this rather very bad practice. What do you think should be your attitude towards the practice, the menace? Thank you, Honorable Chair. I would say that at least at the Supreme Court, the question of trial of Galamse cases doesn't arise because the Supreme Court is not a trial court in that sense. So the Galamse cases will not come to the, the Supreme Court. But I agree with you, the hard work being done by Galamse, and I think that the attitude of the judiciary, where the evidence is produced and the accused persons are found for the judiciary to impose harsh sentences. That one I agree with you entirely because of the environmental hazards, the damage, the destruction that are being caused to our environment, to our river bodies, to the farmlands across the country. But the Supreme Court doesn't hear the uh, Galamse cases as a trial court. Thank you. Yes, Obama. Thank you very much. Uh, congratulations, my lord. Thank you. My lord is a lover of jazz music. I can, I can read from your CV. And who is your favorite jazz person? If I may ask that before the major question. Are you the chair? <laughs> I, took the, I took the judge as well from the University of Ghana from a friend of mine. My favorite judge position was Bob James. Bob James. Thank you, my lord. Um, I've seen that you've attended a lot of seminars, some of which includes the Maritime Law Seminar. 
Recently, Ghana has been having some maritime disputes. And um, we recently resolved the one between Ghana and La Côte d'Ivoire, which we were successful. I know of some discussions going on between Ghana and Togo on some of the same maritime matters. What do you think account for some of these issues that takes us to the international courts? And what are some of the advice you'd want to give to people within the space to enable us to achieve successes when some of these issues arise? Thank you. The Honorable Chair, thank you. The disputes, particularly with the area of uh, maritime zones, mostly has to do with energy and the discovery of energy, oil, gas, and where exactly the boundary, for example, the one between Ivory Coast and Ghana. Where does Ghana's territorial waters end? Where does the territorial waters of Ivory Coast begin. And of course there is also the question of the technology in oil. How deep and slanting. It, it's, it's, there are very technical things that I don't remember if you look at the Ghanaian delegation that handled the, the case you talked about, the Ivory Coast Ghana oil maritime dispute. There were people from across all areas, very technical people. Because it's not simply a question of the sea, it's not like line, where you can easily draw a line from A to B. Underneath the sea, you don't know what goes on there. And that is what creates a lot of those problems. So I think that what we have to do is the current discussion, like you say, we have between Ghana and Togo. In spite of the difficulties of demarcating the maritime boundary, for us to sit, sit down, settle, and properly if it doesn't matter how much it costs us to properly demarcate the maritime boundary so that issues like the discovery of oil, the discovery of gas, doesn't get us involved in litigation as happened in the case of La Côte d'Ivoire. Thank you. Uh, Chair, um, my Lord, there's been issues regarding uh, chieftaincy institution. The constitution has provided for uh, that institution. But lately, conflicts in Boko, conflicts in parts of Ghana, utterances among some chiefs is creating some tensions within the country. I know amongst the jurisdiction of the Supreme Court, the fine, that you have the final jurisdiction when it comes to matters emanating from the uh, judicial committees of the House of Chiefs, National House of Chiefs. We don't have a lot of uh, chieftaincy institutions or schemes codified. Some of the judicial committees are not properly represented. It's a source of worry, and I believe that some of the decisions that the Supreme Court has taken has also created some tensions within some of the traditional areas. But you rightly said, based on facts before you, based on the law, based on the evidence. But I haven't seen a lot of um, training activities. I may be wrong with regards to the knowledge of judges, with regards to and skin men and stool men and customary law practices within certain areas. Do you find that as a source of worry that judges ought to be brought abreast with some key traditional authorities and their traditional practices, especially in some parts of this country where we have issues? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Chair. The chieftaincy is itself 
in some areas a very emotive issue as to who is the proper person to be on the stool or skin, which family are the is or are the right, rightful people to nominate somebody to be on the stool. And these, create, these are the, the real issues that cause confusion. Some people, somebody is not, he, he doesn't belong to the skin or the stool or the gate. That has to be, um, if you like, have to be on stool. And yet wants to be on the, on the stool, wants to be called the chief, he wants to be called Nana. Those are the issues that create chieftaincy issues. As for, and the constitution has, this found, the constitution makers found it necessary to reserve the determination of chieftaincy issues basically to the chiefs themselves from whatever level, traditional, uh, traditional councils, regional house of chiefs, national house of chiefs. The only time when the Supreme Court comes in, as you rightly said, is when an appeal is from the Judicial Committee of the National House of Chiefs. So we as a judiciary do not have much to do with either the enskinement or enstoolment or destoolment of any person. We do have not too many actually, but there are no, I do know that some of our judges have been participating in seminars with the regional houses of chiefs. But not, I, I haven't participated in any seminar involving the issue of chieftaincy. But that is certainly because a lot of chieftaincy issues are left to the chiefs themselves to determine under this constitution. Thank you. Um, I know recently one of your own was elevated by the Asante Hene at um, Suma. Congratulations to Justice Ankama. But my lord, society is evolving and um, very fast, and rightly so, my lord. You have issues of artificial intelligence. Recently, um, I just read that um, WAIEC has canceled the results or suspended the results of some students who use AI to answer some questions, suspected, allegedly. You go to some of our law faculties, it's there, and grandfather, we call it. We are producing all sorts of <laughs> materials within society based on shortcuts to learning. It's a source of worry, especially even members of the bar. Issues of LGBTQ plus issues. Um, recently, Parliament approved the um, regulations to support the production, sale, produ and uh, processing of medicinal cannabis. Society is fast evolving. What are some of the things you will recommend or see the bench to take a major shift to when some of these issues come before you? Because society, like I rightly said, is fast evolving or changing. Thank you and congratulations. Sir. Thank you. It's, it's a very broad Robert question. Was here, sir. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> I was distracted. Yeah, let me hear you, sir. Yes. It's a very broad question. But the judiciary is not also at a standstill. We also want to move with the, with the times. AI, of course, that's a very advanced form of uh, IT, people are doing all sorts of new, new areas. So what we are trying to do is to try to catch up is to do the issue, we have the issue of uh, uh, e-justice, computerization. Those are the areas that, but with respect to other areas, as and when the law changes, the judiciary will move in tandem with the movement of the law. As and when the society moves, the judiciary will move in tandem. We will not be at a standstill because we, are also, we ourselves are also part of society. 
and we do not intend. My, my Lord doesn't want to move before these things, these things catches up with the judiciary. Well, sometimes you move and slip. <laughs> it's it's better to be in tandem with rather than to move ahead and then slip. Yes. Thank you, my Lord. Congratulations. I, I see Kofi Bua here, Deputy Minority Leader from Elembele. <laughs> I don't know if you are the reason why he's here. Your MP is here, Amako Fibwa. He hardly appears. Uh, well, oh, okay, okay. Well. Honorable, maybe yes, that's correct. He's the MP of my area. Uh, your MP wants to congratulate you here, but I say that after the proceedings, I'll give him the space. <laughs> I, I want everybody to see that he's here to support you. <laughs> so it's no use <laughs> against him there. Thank you, Honorable, <laughs> honorable Chair. Yes, Honorable Zuzu first. Thank you very much, Honorable Chair. My Lord, congratulations once more. Thank you, thank you. Um, I've seen that um, you've played some very, very key roles um, in your capacity as a president of Association of Judges and Magistrates of Ghana, and you've also played some very key roles on the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice. And so uh, my uh, issue will be bordered a little bit on human rights generally in Ghana. What would you consider as your assessment of human rights um, practice, human rights promotion uh, in Ghana generally, particularly because of your background as someone who has worked uh, at the Office of Commission on Human Rights, Administrative Justice, all the way to the regional director level? I think the Constitution has a wide range of provisions dealing with fundamental human rights, all provisions. The question is how people, the population seeks to enforce these rights. But I think that generally there is no, I would say that from my, my point of view, there is no general violations of human rights. But where people's human rights are violated, they have access to the courts, they have access to the Commission of Human Rights, they have access to uh, uh, legal aid and other things for, to ventilate whatever grievances grievances they have. And I think that we, we are not doing badly at all in terms of the area of human rights protection and the defense of human rights. I know, I know where honorable member is coming from. So I understand. But I think that as a country, we are not doing badly at all in the area of human rights protection and human rights uh, adjudication generally. Thank you. My Lord, what would you uh, consider as a general, uh, I mean, general protection of human rights? Because in recent times, there are several stories of, for example, the military brutality uh, in Ashaiman. We've had issues of police, um, uh, uh, extrajudicial killings. Uh, we've had several reports in recent times of uh, different levels of violations. So I would consider these ones as real um, uh, violations generally in, 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 in that spectrum. So because you've been at the Commission on Human Rights and Administrative Justice before, um, would you not consider these matters as matters of uh, human rights violation generally in our country? My Lord is asking you, can they have... No, uh, I've, I've heard a lot of talk, talking across. That's why I've kept quiet. No, the human rights, as I said, generally, we are not doing badly. Sometimes you can have exceptions. Some policeman will pick a gun and do something that is not allowed, shoot one or two people dead. That is a violation of somebody's human rights. The military, I know you talked about the Ashama, but I know that some of those things are investigated, but I don't know whether the investigation, the report has come to you or to, I don't know. 
but they are not, as I said, we are not doing badly. If you have one or two exceptions, people going about doing what they are not supposed to do, that I don't consider as a general perception of violations of human rights. <clears throat> Thank you very much, my Lord. Uh, my Lord, I think in an earlier answer to questions posed by uh, Honorable Godfrey Gisau, uh, you had said that a number of cases are handled by the judges. And um, most often than not, people do not appreciate all those cases, but usually have problems with their very limited political cases. Um, and, and should we be worried that uh, Ghanaians generally either rightly so or wrongly has misjudged the conduct of judges in those matters and what do you think that even as a supreme court uh, bench uh, we can do to correct these perceptions honorable member perceptions are generally difficult to, to deal with. Those are the mindset of some people. Now, people go into court to file cases with their own sense of what they expect, irrespective of the evidence, irrespective of the law. That's where the problem, the problem is. A lot of the times, people, some people don't even appreciate the issues. All they know is that this political party, uh, this politician is going after this one, and that is all there is. As to what the real issues in controversy are, they don't even concern themselves with. All they know is that this somebody I follow in politics and he's being attacked by this man, rightly or wrongly. So if the judgment doesn't go the way he expects, naturally, but wrongly, he will proceed to shout from the rooftop that justice has not been done, this person has been cheated. And that's, that's, and that's why I said it's difficult to deal with this kind of perceptions and to say that I will try to ask it to a sweep perception out of it. Perceptions are in the minds of people and it's difficult to deal with. Thank you. My Lord, finally, do you think it's time for us to um, have a contempt act where we can, by law, regulate the remit uh, within which uh, the court exercises its discretion to hold persons for contempt of court right from the lower court all the way to the Supreme Court? Uh, 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 Chair, I, I don't think that there should be a law, as you have now in the UK, for example, on contempt. But in all honesty, how many contempt cases come before the courts across the country in a year? Very few. And where people make so much noise is the contempt involving the media. Seems to me that's where the problem really is people say oh this this media house this journalist is being but judges are attacked people are hounded they use all manner of strange language and the court has no if you like we don't have, we don't carry guns the only power a judge has and that is used not, it's not something that we use, I mean, every day. Once in, I don't even remember for the number of years that I have sat as a judge to have convicted somebody of contempt. And I know a lot of my friends, my colleagues have the same attitude. But you see, sometimes people should be able, also be able to control their emotions, their language, and recognize that judges I also human beings, you attack, you hound, you insult. It's a way of making sure that such a person is brought to justice to know that at least, even though we don't carry a gun, that is the only way we can also 
Yes, that's <laughs> when that's with the, the, uh, the, it, that is your I gun. Don't I don't think that there should be a law. V very well, my lord. Uh, thank you very much. Congratulations once more. Thank you. Thank you. Honorable Brother Champong, do you still want to ask a question? Uh, thank you. Thank you, and uh, congratulations, Justice thank Henry you. and Tony Kofi. Thank you. Um, I see that you started off in Bibiani and then for primary, Methodist Middle, and Yinasi in Elembele, Navrongo, and then um, University of Ghana Law School. I see the routes to entering law school were at the time from very diff difficult terrain. So I want to congratulate you for Thank coming you. this far. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. Um, my, my first question is, um, coming from Enyinasi, I know in Lembele there have been some prominent people that have come up um, on the law trajectory. But from Enyinasi specifically, are you the first one to reach the Supreme Court? Yes, as you, I, I would say so. I would say that from Elamble, from the whole of Elamble, I'll be the first. From the whole of Elamble? I would say well, so. How about Elamble Blay, Freddie Blay? Fre Freddie didn't go to the Supreme Court. Supreme so you're, oh, wow. So Elamble must be very proud of you. Now, uh, following from my uh, senior's question on uh, society evolving, are you familiar with the Gen Z? The what? Exactly. That was the point of my question. Gen Z. I, I, I can't get the pronunciation correctly. Gen Z. No, I don't, I don't know what it is. You do not know no, Gen I Z? I do not know what it is. Okay. All right. Those are people born between uh, 95 and 2010. That generation. 95? And about 2010. Oh, okay. We call them Gen Z. Now that's, that's, that's how they are called. Uh, this, but that's actually my point. I don't remember. But that's. Um, I don't remember, for our record, you have introduced a lexicon that is not known to the Queen's English, which is our. God. So, what did you say it was for the record? Kindly spell it. G E N and Z. Gen Z. You can Google it. There's no E E after it. No. So it's how how does the Queen's Z. English pronounce G E N Z as Gen Z? That's it's, not the Queen's it's English. Gen so it's Gen Z, uh -huh. but it's pronounced Gen Z. Very well. For the point, uh, for the uh, record. Let's make sure that he meant G E N Z. <laughs> uh, Mr. Mr. 1997. Right. Um, but, Mr. Chairman, that's, that's exactly my point. That society is fast evolving. And for a lot of people, even around this side of the table, uh, are hearing Gen Z for the first time. So I can imagine what is happening on my right side, where I see the Supreme Court judges. <laughs> Um, society is evolving, but our laws are, are not. Uh, maybe they don't have to because uh, crime is crime regardless of um, the, the generation that one was born in. But there, there are some lifestyle changes that come per generation. And I, I, I want to ask if it is about time, and, and by the way, e-justice and, and, and all those things are just uh, efficient ways that the courts uh, um, will help you perform. But the law itself, because of the lifestyle changes and the way some of these people behave, are you prepared to lead some reform in the law and some reform in, in thinking on how the, the courts see 
these generations. Sometimes the way you even dress to court in itself, you are guilty. Perception. So are you prepared to lead such a, a transformation to get ahead on, um, on time on, on how some of our young people are behaving? Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member. The Honorable Member, as you know, the judiciary is not involved in lawmaking. That's entirely the, the remit of this, this committee and the House, the, the plenary, if you like. So the judiciary can at best, where we, in a judgment, the judge or the court finds that there is some area that needs reform, make a recommendation. It is done all the time. The court can make a recommendation that such and such an area of the law needs reform. There is even a law reform commission. You could even make a recommendation to the law reform commission to look at this area of the law and see whether this is not an area that can be reformed. But the judiciary, as an institution itself, does not engage in law reform unless in some area where there is some judicial activism. But that is very rarely done. But essentially, it is the remit of you, the legislators, to make laws for the country. Very well. Thank so, in, in effect, if, if, if this side.